2,000 years ago, our Savior was bruised and tattered and beaten. They took his body and they hung him on a cross. As they hung him on the cross, they extended his arms out like this, nailed each hand, and as they nailed each hand and extended his feet, he was straight up upright. Some of y'all can't lift up your hand like this for more than two minutes without saying, ow, this is achy. But he hung on this tree in this way just to breathe because of how he hung on the tree. He had to lift his body up, and every time he lifted his body up, his back scraped up against the wood, his back that had already been beaten with the 39 lashes. Each lash ripped his skin, so he had open wounds on his back. He had open wounds on his back. And those open wounds on his back, each one was as a result of our sins. Your sins, my sins. What, what I want to do for a moment is ask you just for a moment, just for a moment to pause. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Simply say this with me. My sin debt, you paid for. The cross was what I was doing. Yet you took that for me. For me. For me. For me. Open your eyes. This moment is an incredibly important moment. I want to pause, however, and really make sure we understand the magnitude of it. That baby was reminding me of something. If we got any kids here, any kids here, any kids here, anyone school age, middle school, high school, elementary school, there are age appropriate services for you down the hall. All right, so y'all can go. Deuce can see you later. School age, school age, bye bye, bye bye, bye bye. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now y'all should have a little bit of elbow room. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. But please hang with me here. Don't lose the train of thought here. Every breath, every breath was excruciating. The nails in the hands messes me up. You know why it messes me up? It messes me up because, shoot, there were times... I cry when I just get a little cut. You didn't have to agree so quick there. You didn't have to agree so quick there. Get a little cut, little bruise, whatever. I'm like, ow. My man had nails pierced through his body, through his hands. So that means it went on one side and out the other. Pierced. Through. And there he hung on a cross, fully extended. As he hangs on this cross, because the nail came in one side, out the other, then affixed to the wood being post of the cross. He just sat there. Stood there, fully extended. If the story stopped there, it would have been a wretched scene. Everything that he would have claimed would have all just kind of vanished up in smoke. But just like you saw in dramatic fashion, he's not there. He 
got up. And because he got up, there are implications. Today, what we're going to be talking about, really briefly, is a message entitled, It's Undeniable, He is Risen. Turn to the person next to you and say, It's Undeniable, He is Risen. Like Thomas, if you always remember, Thomas is legit one of my favorite disciples. Thomas hears that he got up. And like many of us, Thomas says, nah, homie, I ain't buying it. Homie, don't play that. For those of y'all from that generation, my, my generation. Y'all remember that? Homie, don't play that? Huh? Okay, good. Praise God. Some of y'all. One of y'all. Praise God. Praise God. Okay. Homie, don't play that. Y'all ain't fooling me. What you mean he got up? No one's ever gotten up. And you mean to tell me he got up? I'm not buying it. And then Jesus appears to Thomas. And he says to Thomas, I know you saw them crucify me. Come, put your hands in the holes in my hands from their crucifixion. Because they, they got me, but they failed. Death can't hold me. Death, I've conquered. Thomas, like many of us, asked a legitimate question. What do you mean he got up? But what I want to share with you today is some of the evidence that he got up that affirms our faith. This isn't just a story, y'all. This is fact. And because it's fact, it affirms what you and I believe in. I want to present just a little bit of evidence so that you know and I know that the God that we serve isn't just real. But he rose from the grave, and he, because he rose from the grave, there's no death or situation or circumstance that can keep you from walking out the destiny that he's created you for. Okay, y'all supposed to say amen right there. Is your cue? Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. If you would, I want to make just several claims that attest to the validity of this claim that he got up. First point of evidence that I want to point out to you here really starts with scripture. As children of God, we believe the word of God, right? And you know what the word of the Lord says? Not only does it say he got up, it says he got up and just like you witnessed in this skit, Mary saw him and then Mary went and told the 12 and then the 12 saw him. But then 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that over 500 witnesses saw him. So if you're into conspiracy theory and think maybe one person is covering up for the second person, covering up for the third person, it's really hard to cover up for more than 500 people. We've got these eyewitness accounts that attest to a risen Savior. But it goes beyond just the Christians, right? Because you might say, well, you know, you're saying that, but who's saying that? Christians are saying that. And they're biased clearly because they believe this fairy tale that Jesus done rose, right? And again, good logic, except the fact that it's pushed up against not just by Christians, but also historians, famous historians who are historians from as early as the first and second century attest in their writings that he rose. He didn't just die, he rose, and then there were eyewitnesses to his resurrection. The most famous uh, uh, historian of that era is a guy by the name of Josephus. And Josephus' Josephus's writings affirm and attest to a crucified and risen Savior, man. Okay, so he got up and rose. Really? Really? 
okay, so what are the implications then that he got up and rose? So there's this historical backing, right, that he got up and rose. Then what folks push back up against is, okay, you think he got up and rose? What if, what if it was all just a hoax and he wasn't really dead to begin with? He wasn't really dead to begin with. Again, it runs into both history as well as scientific evidence that debunk that theory. History, again, gives us these rigid accounts, these rigid accounts of what transpired to Christ while he hung on the cross. But the science, it's what's so remarkable, is the science affirms what we see in the scripture. Jesus' side was pierced. Do you all remember this account when Jesus' side was pierced with the spear? Do you all remember what the account says when his side was pierced with the spear? Blood and water came out. And you could make and clearly see the distinction of blood and water coming out. At the time, they had no understanding of what that was scientifically. But what that was scientifically is an attestment, a, a, a physical manifestation, an attestation, if you will, to the fact that he was dying. Because it wasn't just blood that came forth, it was also water that came forth. There's scientific evidence that backs this historical and biblical claim that he truly died. As well as the historic evidence that he rose. But here's the thing that gets me more than every, anything here. Jesus dies in, you know, the year, you know, one, or, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, the year like 33 uh, 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 AD now, after death what we call or, 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 or the common error depends on who you ask, right? But what happens prior to is what's most remarkable to me. You see, we've had historical prophecies pointing to Jesus for thousands of years prior to Jesus. And that's the thing that gets me. Scripture foretold that Jesus was going to come and he was going to die. And then Jesus comes, lives on the earth, and he foretells again of his soon coming death that in three days he was going to get up again. To me, that prophetic scriptural evidence to his death affirming the way in which he was going to die speaks volumes to me. I want to just read one passage that really begins to illustrate what I'm talking about today. If you would, turn with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53. And Isaiah 53, Old Testament prophet that came hundreds of years before Christ, hundreds, hundreds of years before Christ, speaks of what's going to happen to Christ. And look at this. Let's start Isaiah chapter 53 and let's start in verse number four. It says, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions, just like that pierce in his nails and on his side. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, right? The punishment that brought us peace, because y'all recall, right, what does scripture state? Scripture makes plain, right, the wages of sin is death, right? So our sins deserve death, right? But that punishment for our iniquities was placed on him, is what the text says in Isaiah 53, verse 5. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. I'm at verse 6 now. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him, the Christ, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and a sheep before his shearers is silent, and he yet did not open his mouth. Didn't open his mouth. I'm going to jump down to verse 10. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him, cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. 
the prophet speaks to a suffering Christ that's going to come forth to suffer incredible, brutal beatings hundreds of years before the Christ comes. But here's what it also says, and I want to make sure you see it. I want to make sure you see it. After he has suffered, verse 11, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. Y'all see that? It's not just that he suffers. He gets up. He gets up. And it's foretold that he's going to get up. He gets up. He gets up. All right. So he gets up. What does this mean for us? I want to share several implications of the fact that he got up. He didn't just die, was just crucified, but he rose. So what's it mean? Really quickly, the fact that he got up has significant implications on the life of the believer. The very first one I want to share with you is this. The resurrection of Jesus Christ means he's still alive and he's among us today. Turn to the person next to you. Is He's still alive. He's still alive. And so the promise that he will never leave you nor forsake you is real. Why? Because he's still here. He's not dead in a grave, rotten away. He's still here. So his promises are still true. Number two, the resurrection of Jesus Christ means that everything he said, every promise he's given, every claim that he has made is good with heaven's verification. It means that heaven has stamped every promise that he's made. Number three, I'm interested. number three, the resurrection of Christ means that death is defeated. And we never need to fear that faker again. In this earthly realm, without the hope of the resurrection, death seems terminal. But I've got news for you, friends. Death is merely a transition to real life. We're living here in the dash. But after the dash, those of us who are in Christ have an opportunity to actually have real life. Number four, the resurrection of Christ means we've got a gospel like no other message. Like no other world religion. Confucius, you know where Confucius is at? Dead. You know where Buddha at? Dust. Dead. You know where Muhammad's at? Dust. Dead. But you know where our Savior Jesus the Christ is? He's not dead, y'all. He is alive. Here's the biggest implication of that fact. If he's alive, guess what it means? This is the greatest news that's ever been told. If, he, if he's alive, here's the implication. That you and I got a duty to tell everyone we encounter that guess what, y'all? Just like the woman that was at, at the well that met Jesus. She ran and told everybody she could meet and think of and find. Why? Because this news transforms life. This news gives you an opportunity to not just have life eternal, but have life eternal now. Meaning that you can walk with Jesus now. Meaning that you no longer have to live apart from the guidance of the Spirit now. Now. <laughs> but here's the one that gets me. For all who are in Christ from here on into eternity, the news is all good. And any trouble along the way is merely a speed bump. We got speed bumps along our path, but you know what they are? Little speed bumps that we get over and we keep moving. Why? Because everything has been paid for. Everything has been paid paid for. Everything has been paid for. My sins are gone. The charges against me have been nailed to the cross. I can walk in relationship with the Most High God. 
I no longer have to deal with the penalty of my sin debt. What's all of this mean? What's all of this mean? What's all of this mean? Recently, I got a text from a young man that attends our church. We have a little exchange. Prior to BHS, now lives up on campus, goes out to Zoomass. And he sent me this text, and I just want to share the exchange because it has such ramifications to what we're talking about today. Pastor Manny. In a Christian-based seminar on campus, I got a few questions. How do we answer an atheist person about the torture that ensues in hell that comes from God, who we as Christians deem as loving? The question was, how can God, who's supposed to be like a parent to us, be willing to punish us forever? I was kind of stumped on this for a while, and I'm looking back to hearing your response. I said, bless you, man. Hope you're doing well. Great question from your friend. I'm not going to answer. Those of you who know me know that's how I get down. Rather, I want to empower you to discover the character of God for yourself, as that better equips you to stand in your defense. Right? So that's the thought process. In case you don't know, that's kind of what some of our philosophy here in ministry. We want to make sure you're grinding, you're studying, and as you're studying and discovering, we then get to come along and support and affirm and applaud you as you get to know Jesus. And so I respond this way, and then I kind of expound on that. I'm like, I've wrestled through these questions in the past, and the best thing I can tell you is prayerfully study. Start with a Google search on God and hell. But be sure to read every scripture reference in context as you have to test the spirit. Please share your findings thereafter with scriptural references, and remember... This is about the character of God. So that's my response to the brother. And of course, like these millennials do, this is how he responds. Ben, thank you, PM. I'll keep you posted. These millennials, these millennials, right? So that's how he responds. And, 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 then, and then I see him the following Sunday. I see him the following Sunday. And I'm like, bro, what up? What did you discover? And then he goes, the minute I began to do some research, it was so obvious. God is a God of love, but he's also a God of justice. It's part of who he is, right? So, of course, he loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Of course he loves us. He's loving. But because he's also justice, there has to be a penalty for the sin debt. And I was like, ding, 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 biblical scholar. Right on. You see, here's what it boils down to, friends. Here's what it boils down to, and I'm praying that you're hearing me. The God that you serve endured a gruesome, excruciating death so that you and I could have opportunity to be made right and into relationship with him. But here's what it boils down to. We have got to accept his gift of love to us. We've got to accept the gift. You can have a gift, but if you never receive the gift, then you don't have the gift. You can be entitled to a car, but if you don't go and take the keys, then it's not your car. Even though they paid for the car and left it for you to go take. The gift is there. Have you received the gift? The gift is there. Have you received it? Your sin debt has been paid, but have you received that payment? Every eye closed, every head bowed. So funny how true this Sunday school Bible verse resonates. You learned this at three, four, five years old, many of you anyway. 
But he so loved us all, he gave his son, that whosoever believes shall not perish, but have life eternal. With every eye closed and every head bowed. The question for of the hour, and really the question of the entirety of your life, is have you earnestly received the gift? Have you earnestly received the sacrifice of Jesus? Received the sacrifice of Jesus' death on the cross on your behalf? Have you earnestly received it? As you're pondering this question, I want to present to you the evidence of knowing that you're walking with Jesus and you've received the gift. Anyone who encountered Jesus and earnestly received him cannot stay the same. It's impossible. When Jesus comes in and enters in your heart, he begins to do a work that transforms you, that changes you into his likeness. Day by day, you discover more and more of him and you get to begin to see him do a work on you changing you into his likeness right now while every eye is closed and every head is bowed if you're in this room today and you're not sure if you're in relationship with him I want to pray for you so if that's you and you sense the Lord knocking on your heart I'm just going to invite you to lift up your hand lift up your hand I want to pray for you. Hallelujah. You are not alone in this place. Lift up your hand. We want to pray for you. Hallelujah. 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 Father, Jesus, I really sense that there are more of you here who are in this place of grappling. saved? Am I not saved? I don't know. If you don't know, today is the day of your assurance that you know that you know. I want to pray with you right now. I'm going to invite you. Matter of fact, I'm going to invite everyone to simply repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, your word says, that all have sinned and fallen short of you. It then says that the wages of that sin is death. But if we believe in you, we can have life eternal. So today, we present ourselves before you, desiring to say we believe and we confess our sins to you. Forgive us of all iniquity. Cleanse us with your blood. We receive your love today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.